everybody. Hope, hope the lunch is good. Uh, all right, so, uh, so it's 12.30, so let's get started. My, my name is Tushar Gohad. I'm, I'm part of a Intel Corporation's data center group. Uh, my team focuses on uh, storage acceleration, um, and specifically, you know, with, with respect to this topic, this uh, storage acceleration for solid state disks. So, uh, so let's, let's jump right in. So to begin with, some uh, you know some, some hyper words, right? Hyperscale cloud. That's what uh, OpenStack and you know the other clouds are about. The other upcoming theme is hy hyperconvergence, right? That's the other hyper word. Uh, and at the, at the center of it all, uh, at least from the way we see it, it's non-volatile memory. So yeah, I just wanted to quickly. Uh, Get, get a show of hands. How, how many of you get, you guys are using uh, solid state media in some some shape or form? All right. Uh, how many of you are actually using it in the with the newer interfaces like NVM Express? Oh, that's that's great. So, uh, all right. So that kind of familiarity will make this talk go very smoothly. So I don't need to jump into NV, NVM Express uh, introduction. So, <clears throat> so. Uh, let's talk about uh, you know what's 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 going on in the industry, right? So if you if you look at uh, the trends, right? Uh, I mean, and, and you you guys may have already seen this picture uh, last few years, uh, where where what we see is the the traditional enterprise storage is, is shrinking in, in favor of uh, you know hyperscale storage, which is which is cloud, um, and you know with the likes of EMC. Uh, and and other analysts out there basically think that the, you know accompanying this this transition you know we we also have the the media transition happening so you're basically going from your your, your tapes to you know spinning disks now the transition is uh, basically spinning disks to flash media or solid state media as we as as we we reach the you know cost parity in terms of dollar per gigabyte uh, you know, by around 2020. So, um, so solid solid state media has been around around for a while. Um, you know, uh, it, it's just that you know the, the software stacks haven't been have been haven't been th thought out because because of the penetration. So, so what uh, whenever you look at you know uh, architecture options for your cloud, you know uh, there are there are a couple of metrics that that folks need to focus on, which are. <clears throat> Dollar per gigabyte and dollars per IOPS, right? Each each of these translates into two two matrix, right? One for your uh, you know what what you're spending, like you know in, in terms of dollar per gigabyte, which uh, which kind of uh, dictates your you know storage efficiency. How much CPU do you need to drive the storage that you have in 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 a, in a box, which is always uh, ends up being a trade-off between uh, CPU cycles that that you have available versus latency that kind of dictates the the system cost right uh, and the density, and then dollar per apps which which basically uh, kind of always depends on the uh, the storage stack of choice and and data path simplicity as we call it and again I'm going to go into details of this but this is kind of the the broad theme of things right so we are we're trying to uh, basically optimize around these matrix. For for the upcoming you know uh, transition in in solid state media, so 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 if you if you guys look at the, the, the you know the transition or uh, let's say uh, 30 years you know uh, basically we, we we look at uh, spinning media which have been around for, for forever right which uh, which we, we we're talking about less than 500 IOs per second your IO latencies tend to be in in milliseconds. To SATA and NAND SSDs, which are uh, which are your you know most prevalent solid state media from from your client systems to server systems, right? Where you you're actually talking about you know uh, multiples of hundred times as many IOPS and much lower latency, right? Uh, still, the the interface uh, is you know when, when you change from let's say SATA to NVMe. Things become even more interesting, right? So, so if you look at the state-of-the-art media today that are based on the NAND, in the NAND family, 
you'll see that you can actually generate close to half million IOs per second. These, these are four kilobyte IOs per second with a uh, with a less than micro, 100 microsecond latency, which uh, which is which is a big leap from from your traditional you know hybrid based media. And if you look at uh, let's say any traditional storage stacks that are uh, that have been designed with uh, with you know storage as as the slowest component as the basis, um, you know the, the, the you can probably imagine that you know the design uh, from going from let's say aspect going from hard drives to NVMEs need to change drastically. And again, you know when we uh, Intel actually recently released uh, an Optane flavor of SSD, which which makes it even more interesting. You can actually get a uh, similar number of IOs per second uh, at, at much lower uh, application parallel, should I say parallelism or multi-threading with a sub-10 microsecond latency. So, so it's, you know, th things are uh, mo moving quite a bit faster. So, so how, do we, uh, how do we rethink or opti optimize those today's storage stacks to take the best advantage of the, the NVMe class media or, or the upcoming Intel Optane SSDs. Right? So, so let's, let's look at it uh, a level deeper, right? So if you look at uh, you know, any st storage stack, right? It's, it, it, so let's say this is, this is basically a picture of the Linux kernel the, uh, and uh, underneath like all the way down at the, at the driver level. So let's say you, you have your, uh, you know, hard drive controller driver and, and, and the other component is basically the drive, right? So, so let's say uh, you, your driver latency, let's, let, for discussion's sake, let's say stays constant, which is your software latency. Um, compared that to your, your, your media latency, right? Uh, you, you, you will see that the shift is that from in, in, with hard drives, your software latency is negligible. Most of your latency is actually coming from your, the, the media itself, the media access latency. But as you, as you progress towards the more and more faster media, it actually, the driver latency itself becomes a much bigger part of uh, you know, your, your software latency so, or the storage latency as a, as a whole, right? So, so as you can see, when we when we approach the 3D cross point or the even the NAND storage media, you know uh, there is a between 20 to 90 percent, uh, you know, contribution actually comes from your existing storage stack. So, what this says is you're, you know, if you're not optimizing your storage stack, uh, or your vendor is not optimizing your storage stack, you are not getting what you paid for because you know the, the cost also goes up as you as you go across on the horizontal axis here. Um, so, so again, this is kind of a summary, right? So basically, uh, this is the key point, right? What used to be efficient on hard drives is, is no more efficient on SSDs. And that's why we need to rethink software. And so what, what we have been working on is, is basically a few primitives the, you can think about uh, these as these, these Lego building blocks for bringing a storage stack uh, for, for these faster media. So welcome to SPDK. So we, we actually uh, started a pro project called Storage Performance Development Kit, uh, which sounds just like a DPDK um, uh, for, for those who are familiar with the DPDK for networking, right? And, and what it did um, to, the, to the routing workloads, right, bringing those from traditional merchant silicon onto x86 based standard servers, we're kind of, we're, we're kind of doing the same thing for storage here, right. Um, so, so again, kind of continuing the discussion, right, so your traditional storage stacks, um, which are very, very prevalent, you know, Linux kernel based stacks, Here's a, here's a kind of deep dive on where, where we see the latency being added, right? So here's a simple, uh, you know, basically a simple list of, of, of things which, uh, you know, those who are familiar with the operating system layer would, would easily recognize, right? Uh, the overhead typically comes from interpaneling, context switches, 
uh, uh, synchronization. Synchronization is, is locking. So, uh, so waiting unlocks, which can be, uh, you know, even, even waits for memory allocations, uh, DMA mappings uh, on the device layer, system calls, which uh, is part of the, the context switch, and also the, the generic block layer, which, which tends to be monolithic, which means uh, all, all of your applications, although you have many cores available on the system, uh, your application requests are funneled through a single, you know, more of mo monolithic block layer in the, in the kernel, right? Um, and this is actually a, uh, so if you, if you have an NVMe SSD today, right, uh, let's say uh, state-of-the-art NVMe media uh, as a local disk, if you're basically, uh, let's say, you're looking at the latency uh, breakdown, right? I mean, and, and so th these are there's some details around NVMe driver which you may not don't have to pay too much attention to. But what's important here is that uh, we can actually by by rethinking all these primitives uh, on on how you you actually build your storage stack, you can bring the latency down quite a bit. Now, how do we do this, right? So, um, so you can actually reduce a, a lot of jitter. Um, and and that you know uh, what do you say non determinism by by actually you know believe it or not asynchronous pull mode so you can actually write your applications or uh, your storage stack using pull mode drivers in, instead of interrupt driven drivers uh, like one I mean you, you may ask oh, how how can you know how can I use pull mode for for latency but you know traditionally uh, interrupts have been have been considered the the you know the the preferred way to uh, to actually get the best la latency possible, but but if you actually look at how many IOs you're you're doing in here per per second, um, you know you, you you most likely most likely cannot cannot really sustain those IOs, and that's just going to generate jitter, uh, you know. And pull mode, you know, uh, in in what, what we have found out, and as DPDK proved for networking, uh, tends to be the way to to go, right? Uh, we, we tend to be lock light, so we, we try to basically create as many parallel contexts of execution as possible, and which are independent. So you, you have less hotspots, less uh, uh, you know, contention points, so you can be lockless or lock light, at least. Right? Uh, user space hardware access, so this is actually, there, there are actually many frameworks available today where, which, which let you basically move your kernel-based uh, storage drivers or you know, essentially your device drivers into user space. So, so the, the device driver can be part of your application image in, in user space. This is a big win because you don't, that saves you from the context switch overhead. Uh, one more, and a, and a pretty significant um, memory adder tends to be DMA mappings and memory allocations. Uh, as the system ages, you, you, you need to try harder to get, get memory, which, which, where, which basically leads you to block, right? So we, so we use the huge pages feature, which, is, which basically you know, kind of reserves a, a large area of memory, uh, so you don't have to, which, which is basically managed by, by SPDK. Uh, so you don't have to go, go to the kernel asking for, for mo more pages at, at runtime. And then we, we, we also developed a generic, uh, instead of having a generic block la la layer that works for all sorts of media, we have a, uh, a block layer that, that we, we basically created for, specifically for flash media, right? So, <clears throat> so just in this example, right, I mean, we, we actually have uh, a, an SPDK NVMe driver upstream, which I'll go into details with, but I just wanted to kind of give an uh, a example as to what kind of gains you can can expect using uh, a user space pole mode uh, model is uh, just with, with local NVMe media you can you can do 10x better per core or 10x be better overall right again this this picture kind of sh shows you the scale uh, which basically shows you that you can you can actually do uh, do your NVMe SSD access like a lot more efficiently which which results in CPU savings and you know saves you a lot more CPU cycles to do more important work. And I mean, if you, if you think about it, with with hyperconverged systems where where you have a you know your your compute workloads and storage workloads running on the same system, you you cannot afford to 
you know, let storage steal all your CPU. And as the as the media gets faster, uh, you know, the number of number of IOS per second that you need to handle kind of translates into a lot more CPU being used. Uh, and that's why this per per core efficiency tends to be very important. Right? Uh, this this is uh, you know the same same example with a 3D crosspoint media. So uh, are, are you, how many of you are familiar with the 3D crosspoint media? Yes. All right. Thanks. So, so this is actually a, uh, a, a next generation solid media, solid state media that Intel uh, released last month, uh, which gives you uh, sub 10 microsecond latency with the NVMe uh, interfaces. It's uh, the same media can be configured as a block device or a or a memory mode, um, and you know the, the the best thing about these devices is that even at Q depth one. Which is which is basically a single thread access. You can actually you can expect um, you know as many more than hundred thousand IOPS. Which uh, and and just comparing the let's say your traditional kernel based stack versus SPDK stack, right? You can you can see that you, you basically get two hundred times efficiency in terms of IOPS and latency. So so we talked about you know some some proof points okay uh, yeah spdk gives you great performance but what it, what is it so so it's a it's it's an open source project at this point we open sourced it last year uh, it's uh, it's bsd licensed so you you're free to uh, download it integrate it with, with with your with your stack contribute your changes back and so on uh, we have composable building blocks for uh, for building storage stacks for uh, flash media, and and like in the, in the central theme is that it is all user space and pole mode, so it's a kernel bypass model for storage. Uh, so SPDK.io is is basically the uh, the website where you can find more about it. Right. So let's let's go into a little bit more detail as to. Uh, what does SPDK contain today, uh, other than just the NVMe driver that I talked about? Right? So NVMe driver was our, you know, start easy starting point because uh, we wanted to, you know, that that's the lowest level, closest to the device uh, storage element that we wanted to bring to user space. So that's where we started. But then, uh, you know, where else can we apply? So so if you if you look at what's going on in the cloud, right? Uh, one place where we we saw you know, uh, an ex extension of the, the NVMe concept was, you know, the, the disaggregation uh, that's happening. So where, uh, in order to uh, scale compute and storage separately from each other, uh, you know, you, you're you're basically uh, creating you know storage pools that are separate from your compute pools, right? And a uh, an emerging protocol under that R RDMA theme. Uh, tends to be the NVMe over fabrics, so so we actually worked on an N NVMe over fabrics target and and an initiator. Which, I mean, you know, it, for those that are familiar and use iSCSI, uh, you know, this is this is kind of the the NVMe and RDMA version, uh, a, a low latency fabric that lets you access uh, you know remote NVMe storage uh, from your compute, right? So that's that's one one area where we worked on. The other area is, uh, you know, this is not just about your, your storage side, right, in your storage stack. It's also the access from your virtual machines to storage, right? That needs to be accelerated as well. So we, uh, so on, on the virtualization side, we, we actually did some work. Uh, for, for those who are familiar with vHost, you know, uh, so the, vHost is a, is a method of accessing, um, you know your your host devices from a from a KVM QMU uh, kind of instance with uh, in in the pole mode fashion. So actually, kernel also has an implementation uh, for for networking and storage. Uh, we we did we did a user space implementation for uh, SPDK there. So <clears throat> again, all all of that you know that discussion kind of leads to. What do we have today available as part of this SPDK stack, right? So, so I'll start at the um, start at the bottom real, real quick, right? So, so we basically have uh, user mode drivers for NVMe, you know, PC, PCI-based NVMe de devices, as well as NVMe or Fabrics initiators. 
So, so th these drivers can be used for NVMe local storage on, on your compute nodes, on, let's say your no OpenStack compute nodes for LVM-like uh, storage. Uh, and for LVM-like uh, layer, we, we actually have uh, something called Blob Store and BlobFS, which is a append-only file system, uh, which lets you uh, use SPDK as a you know, pseudo software-defined storage uh, with Cinder. And, and the Cinder and Nova integration is still in progress, but you, you, you'll see it, it uh, happen pretty soon. Um, let me quickly see if I can. And then we, we have uh, an application framework. So, uh, <clears throat> so the SDK gives you, uh, you know, the, the kernel-like features where, where you, you get your, uh, you know, driver, uh, you know, bare, bare bits of your storage stack, but you, you still do need an application API to talk to it. So we actually have an application framework, which is also upstream. Uh, we, we have a, a, a few... We have a few integration points like uh, RocksDB um, and, and Ceph. So we, we actually have some examples upstream, which, which you can look at on how, how to integrate uh, SPDK with, with your application or with your storage stack. Let's, let's jump into the, the virtual machine efficiency, right? Which, uh, so when you talk about OpenStack, right, uh, and the question would be, you know, where does SPDK fit in? So the, this is actually the most natural sp uh, place where, where we thought it would. So, so NOAA managed, or NOAA and Cinder managed virtual machines based on KVM and QMU, right? So, so this is your, uh, so let's say you, you actually had a compute node. This is your traditional model of uh, deploying a QMU, uh, QMU KVM based uh, virtual machine that has access to, let's say, some NVMe storage on your host, right? So the default uh, would, would put you uh, with, with a Vertio SCSI driver. And if, if anybody has measured the, uh, you know, the efficiency of accessing NVMe storage, local NVMe storage from a virtual machine, it is pretty poor today. It's, I mean, you're, you're not getting worth your money, essentially. So then came Viho SCSI, uh, which, which makes it a, a little bit better. So, so you can actually, so there, there, there was a VHOS framework created in the kernel, which gave, gave you some, you know, a, a faster power virtualization um, in, in, in the host. And what makes it even better is, is you, if you go to an all SPDK model where, uh, <clears throat> where you're, you're basically, you know, polling uh, instead, of, uh, instead of doing your context switches and waiting for, uh, for being interrupted. Uh, it, it actually does, uh, you know, a lot, lot better, right? So, so this is kind of the, the deployment model, right, where you have uh, basically a virtual machine accessing uh, NVMe's local storage via a SPDK-based storage stack. Um, these components shown in, in, in here, right, are, most of them are actually available upstream. Uh, this, this blob Blob Store is an SDS kind of component, software-defined storage kind of component that we are soon, soon up, upstreaming on spdk.io. But, but today, you can put this all together uh, by simply pulling the bits down from spdk.io to, to accelerate access from your virtual machines to, uh, to local NVMe media. Um, some statistics, you know, so basically we, uh, with this model, we were able to get 8x better efficiency as compared to, uh, you know, your tra traditional kernel-based models. And if you, if you look at your, your QMU world IO, right, so, so let me go back to the picture here. So basically going from your world IO to vhost, um, you, you, you basically get, get about, you know, five to, five to 6x benefit. But when going from your kernel to SPDK model, we, we have seen eight, to 17x benefit over your traditional, you know, uh, VM access model. So, and, and th this 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 part is actually very important because no, no matter how how fast your storage stack is, right? Let's say your remote storage is, um, uh, or or your local storage in this case, right? Um, if if your virtual machine cannot access all the available IOPS, then then you're throwing throwing away money basically. So. Um, this this is another way to look at look at the same thing. So so if you if you look at the comparison of the three approaches that I showed, QMU, Vertio, VHost, SCSI, based on kernel, 
and VO SCSI based on SPDK, right? Um, this, the, the bottom chart shows you how many IOPS can I handle per core. And, and as, you, as you can see, it's, we're able to handle almost a million IOPS per core easily, which, which, is, you know, which, is, which kind of translates to if I have a state-of-the-art state of NVMe device today that gets me close to a million IOPS, I only need one core on, on, my, on my host or, or one virtual core to get all of that bandwidth as opposed to uh, you, you can basically compare yourself, right? So. And again, uh, I'll, I'll basically leave, leave this as a, you know, as a homework to read, read for you guys. So again, that's a summary right there. So, so this is actually a public study on you know, uh, folks using, y using this framework to accelerate their workloads. This is obviously non-OpenStack cloud example, uh, but, but this is actually was publicly shared. Right, so, uh, and and it, it actually uh, shows pretty pretty promising, um, you know, random write uh, IOPS and latency improvements, right? Which, which, which serves as a pretty good proof point for for how you can actually, you know, uh, better your virtualization in, in infrastructure uh, in, in preparation for this NVMe media transition. So. So yeah, so they, they basically saw about 300% improvement in IOPS and latency when using SPDK from their virtualization infrastructure. Uh, this is another example that they had published. So one of the uh, big workloads that's moving on to OpenStack and prior clouds is uh, databases, so database as a service. So, so the, the same, same cloud, the Alibaba ACS, they, they actually have published a MySQL Based on SPDK kind of study, so as you can as you can see, you know they they, they saw a huge, I mean, about 10, 10x improvement, right? Uh, so rather 4.6x queries per second, uh, you know, there, there's uh, for for both reads and and write transactions, right? So so this is all talking about local storage with, uh, with NVMEs, right? Uh, what about remote storage? Because with OpenStack, you know, the, the most prevalent block storage is, uh, is Ceph, uh, and then you have other disaggregated stor storage options coming out, like, like the one I talked about, NVMe or Fabrics. W what about those options, right? So, so let's, let's talk about those quickly here. So as part of the SPDK stack that we have upstream, uh, we, we have a, an NVMe or Fabrics target. Um, and, and all of the pieces that you see here, uh, which, which basically include a, uh, a block device layer, which lets you access a remote RDMA storage using an NVMe or Fabrics initiator. Um, so this is, this is all available and usable today, right? Uh, where you can, you can basically consume uh, from your KVM instance NVMe or Fabric storage, right? And as I mentioned earlier, we actually have a, uh, you know, a, an effort, in fact, Nova and Cinder blueprints that are in progress to get NVMe or Fabric support um, into, into Cinder and Nova. We, we, we are gonna support both the kernel as well as SPDK options, but the SPDK option will be available is the point. Um, so, in terms of performance of the of the NVMe or Fabrics target, you know, uh, if you so so what what we show here in the in those blank squares is basically the number of cores that were used to uh, to get the line rate. So we actually had had about uh, you know 150 gig worth of networking on on the on the test backend to uh, to get to that. That performance level, you know, SPDK basically used just three cores on the on, on the target side. So you you basically have let's say a a two U enclosure that has let's say 24 NVMe devices with with a fast backend, right. with a fast networking backend to to saturate that you know uh, most of the IOPS. SPDK just took three Xeon E5 cores, whereas with with kernel we we basically took like about 30. So, uh, so again, you know, this kind of summarizes, you know, why we were able to, you know, what were the changes uh, from, uh, from your traditional NVMe or Fabrics targets available in the kernel, 
uh, that that we that got us to to this result, right? So, so I I want to pause and see if there are any questions so far. Would you mind using the mic, please? Thanks. Uh, when you say uh, NVMe over fabric, mm -hmm. do you mean uh, fiber channel or Ethernet? Right. So, so fiber channel, uh, Ethernet, those were those have been the traditional iSCSI fabrics, right? Um, so NVMe over fabrics can be, you know, any of those fabrics. So the, the fabric is is kind of a neutral term, but the most more popular one that's being talked about are the, is the RDMA fabric with, with Rocky V2 or uh, iWarp, which is, uh, so basically the, you, you, can, you can do NVMe over fabrics over TCP2, right? I mean, it's, it's a standard under development, um, but, but, the, but the value in, in, in having RDMA as your fabric is that you, don't, you, you then don't lose the latency. So if you, if you remember the first slide uh, where I, I was trying to describe the problem, like where software is the bottleneck, right? The device actually gives you, uh, let's say, sub 10 microsecond latency uh, uh, for argument's sake, right? But you're, if your network adds, like you know, for TCP or fiber channel, if your network adds hundreds of microseconds to it, right? You, you lose the benefit of actually paying for the NVMe media. So, so you, you need a lo low latency fra fabric. So, so most of this discussion is actually around RDMA. But, but to your question, you, know, you, can, you can use you know, any of the traditional fabrics or RDMA uh, to do NVMe or fabrics. The, the, the standard that as it exists today has been written mostly with RDMA in mind though. Now, the, let's come to the other popular option for remote storage, you know, uh, for, for accessing uh, self storage uh, from, from an SPDK backed, uh, you know, compute side stack, right? We, we actually have a, a block device uh, which, which supports Ceph RBD. So you could create, um, you know, virtual machine images on your, on your Ceph cluster and, uh, you know, access those, those volumes. Uh, Underneath an SPDK stack from a virtual machine. So, so again, uh, the, the layering actually works with the vhost SCSI target. So you get the the benefit of vhost SCSI, and and it you know it, it can talk to Ceph. So it it's it's basically you know this was created for a, for a drop-in compatibility with your existing setup if you want to uh, switch to this model. And again, you know it it does. Uh, you know, basically all of this development actually has been done with KVM and KMU in, in mind uh, as, as the first, first integration point. So it, it, it actually is very suitable for OpenStack and deployments. <clears throat> so um, so this, this, this is basically the, the store SPDK.io kind of screenshot. You know, we, we recently had a, uh, a developer summit, which was our first, uh, you know, like developer conference where we had about uh, you know, 80 to 90 companies participate uh, in, in, in the project. We, uh, you, you guys are welcome to go to spdk.io where you can find all the, all the talks. So, so all of the components that I, I just talked about uh, as part of the architecture diagram. Um, so let me quickly go back to So, so we did deep dive talks at the SPDK summit on uh, going going into the the NVMe or Fabrics target, the the vhost the vhost SCSI or the vhost block target for accelerating your virtual machines, as well as the the file system that we are building, um, and there was also a, a, a performance oriented deep dive as to how we do our performance measurements and you know uh, how to how to do how to tune SPDK-based apps, how to profile them, and so on. You can actually find all of those details in the, like in, in the talk, um, you know, like in the, in the SPDK Summit website, which is soon going to have all the videos as well. So <clears throat> let me, OK. All right. So. 
So that's kind of all, all I had for SPDK as a, for an overview. Uh, our, I'm going to pause for any questions before I, I jump onto the next topic for storage, actually. Right, so those are uh, in independent project and projects, right? So as part of the storage acceleration software umbrella, right? So SPDK uh, tends to basically, you know, uh, solve some r real software stack design issues. ICL is, is basically a, um, how should I say, kind of vectorizing your storage workloads, which is, which is more of a, you know, middleware or application layer library, right, which is a separate project. So I'll, I'll go into the details, but the numbers that, that, that we have quoted, right, those don't include any compression or in, encryption or hashing, those type of workloads. So, so that's where ICIL plugs in. Um, but because you, you asked, actually, let me, let me see if I can show you a, real, a picture real quick. So, so we, we basically uh, have a layering that's possible where you could actually plug in like your own storage service right right here in, in the SPDK stack, and this could be layered with something like like the like the ISL library that is, that I'm going to talk about, right? So, so all of the performance benchmarks were essentially mostly at the block layer, uh, did not involve any any of these workloads. So, any other questions? Okay, that, that brings us to the next topic, which is uh, intelligent storage acceleration library. Uh, <clears throat> so, SPDK is, is, a, is a project we, we started about uh, three years ago. Um, uh, ISIL actually date, dates back uh, a little bit further, uh, and in fact, actually has has a lot of industry pen penetration already. A lot, of, a lot of folks in the in the OpenStack would also know it because um, the the major storage components of OpenStack already integrate this project. Uh, the, but at, at the basis of, uh, of, of this, this library are a few things, right? So, so when you look at any modern x86-based processor, um, we, you know, we, we have you know, certain instruction sets for vector applications, like basically the, the, which started with the MMX uh, instruction set uh, it was replaced with SSE, uh, and now the instruction set is called uh, AVX. This family of instructions is, is known as the single instruction multiple data uh, operations, which, is, which basically lets you parallelize a lot of workloads, which tends to be very useful for you know, your, your, your graphics and video kind of workloads. Now, on, on a standard x86 server, um, that, that, that those set of primitives are, are pretty much unused. Right, so so you've already paid for the processor, but the AVX you have AVX 512 or 256 instructions, but you're not using them. So um, so one one researcher on my team basically decided to put those to use. Right, so so, so ICEL is, is is a way to um, you know literally hand optimize some of the storage primitives like compression, encryption, hashing, erasure coding. Um, by you know these these uh, most of the cases these primitives tend to be uh, you know like they lend themselves very well to vectorizing or parallelizing right um, so we what we do is we we basically use the SIMD instruction sets uh, to uh, to basically optimize these functions right so so again uh, hand optimized libraries for compression encryption uh, you know which which are for data integrity security. Uh, and data protection, we have uh, we we have it supported on Linux BSD Windows. Uh, the the library is is compatible with with most of the 
uh, standard APIs, like for instance, compression is uh, compatible with the, with the gzip library, right? GZIP, very similar to the gzip interface, I would say. Uh, encryption, uh, a lot of those primitives have been actually you know, integrated and are compatible with OpenSSL. Um, so let's talk about some more details. So, so it, it is a pure assembly library. It's, it's, it's hand, hand tuned. Although it's, it, it's, it's open source, it is, it's written in assembly, it has C, C++ bindings. So application, uh, I mean, in many cases you can, you can simply replace your gzip based compression calls in your storage stacks or, or, or app, even applications to, to ISIL based compression. The same applies to encryption. Uh, the other, other primitives might take some work, uh, but, but if you can parallelize your workload, you know, uh, ISL can, can help a lot. So, um, again, this is free and open source. It's, it's uh, hosted on our GitHub, github.com, uh, you know, portal. This website, sorry, this, this slide basically does a, it's a good job summarizing, you know, what are the functions that are available. Um, so we, we do support, you know, your traditional XOR, PQ, or erasure code, you know, Reed Solomon erasure codes. We also have a Reed Solomon Cauchy erasure code. Uh, these actually have been integrated into OpenStack Swift and Ceph. So, so for, for those of you that, that use erasure code, codes with, uh, with Swift or Ceph might have used ICEL as a, because it, you know, in many of the distros, ICEL tends to be the default policy for erasure coding. We have uh, CRC support. Uh, which, uh, which, uh, which actually we are we're looking to integrate into Ceph for, uh, for some of the crush enhancements. Uh, we, we have cryptographic hashes, which are MD5 and SHA. Um, now this is a family of uh, hashes, uh, which are multi-buffer, multi uh, called multi-buffer hashes, which, which give you, um, you know, big performance boost over your single, uh, single thread hashes. And we, we have the whole you know, family support, including the SHA-1 plus mur murmur. We, we have uh, gzip compression and de decompression support, as well as, you know, uh, a number of flavors of AES, right, supported under ISIL. So, so this is, uh, kind of, let's, let's start talking about compression, C comparing it to the open source, you know, the, the software-only options that you, that are basically your drop-in gzip, Kind of libraries, right? So, so if you uh, if you actually look at the the table to the right, the the, the, the rightmost column basically gives you the the compression ratio, and and the middle column is the throughput in megabytes per second. Now, this was this was actually a uh, head-to-head cache cold test that was run on gzip and ISL. So, it's it's always a, a trade-off between your compression ratio, i.e., your Compression level being one one to nine, um, or you know the comp basically getting a good compression ratio uh, along with that level, and also optimizing throughput. So so I sell uh, you know compared to to, to the to the LZ4 and the, the very very fast ones, right? It it basically comes very close, uh, and and gives you much better compression ratio. So LZ4 is uh, family is actually considered to be the fastest in the in the right now. With uh, with compression ratios that are you know acceptable, just acceptable. ISL gets you the similar throughput with with a much better ratio. Right, so, so how how many uh, of you actually have used ISL or read about it or because I uh, yeah I think I, I need to ask that question before I go further. Not used to it, okay. But but use cases like is it, has it been compression? Like what what have you used it or thought about used it for using it for? Have we used it to compare against the full flow of RAID controllers? Okay, so so RAID controller. So so that was more P P plus Q or XOR kind of deals. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so that that's actually a, a, a good point, right? Where uh, you do have the option of going to a, a discrete PCIe-based hardware accelerator for for your storage workloads, like you know primitives. 
but then it, it basically not, it isn't just additional cost to your platform, but it costs you cycles to go over PCIe bus, and you know, you're ping-ponging between the memory and, uh, main memory and the device memory and so on. ICIL basically does all of, uh, of you know, does all these functions in, in, in memory, right? So in, in, in the same, same thread. Uh, so that's, that's the best part. So you, you don't have to leave, leave the CPU. You don't have to uh, bounce your caches or uh, you know, lose your caching benefits to, to lower your CPU utilization. So, so, um, so, so the, I mean, we, we, like, we like to say that you know, the, cost is, the cost to ICL is basically zero other than the CPU cores. So that's kind of hold true, holds true here. So. So we uh, so here is actually a study that uh, that we recently published, which is using ICL based compression to uh, to accelerate genomics workloads. Um, so so this was actually uh, you know a, a lot of a lot of data uh, for for the cancer clouds um, you know uh, where where we we were able to show sh uh, with the ICL ba based uh, Compression, right? Which is uh, compared to the to their default Java-based compression, you know, the which is gzip-based. We were able to basically reduce the time. The, the we were able to improve the compression ratio uh, and, and reduce the time by by a half. So, This is the this is the next ne next set of uh, functions or next set of primitives that are very useful in in, in storage, uh, particularly when it comes to solid solid state media, right? Uh, given the the dollar high dollar per gigabyte uh, properties of this media, compression and deduplication tend to be the you know the most prominent workloads. I mean, which uh, you know most important workloads, right? So. So multi-buffer hash routines in ICL basically gives you uh, give you support for MD5 and all the all the SHA family. Um, again, you know you, you you can basically use it to for as a data integrity checker or or deduplication to um, to basically sh you know show you how how th this kind of shows you how the you know data chunking and and vectorization happens among the uh, the SIMD registers on a, on a Xeon processor. So, uh, so you know, your, your incoming stream is basically, uh, you know, like undergoes this process of variable, variable length chunking. Uh, it's, it's basically a, a rolling hash, which, uh, w which where, you know, a chunk, those chunks are actually processed in parallel in, in, those, in these vector registers. And you can see up to, you know, 15x performance for, uh, for your SHA family, you know, of, of algorithms over OpenSSL. So, um, again, you know, basically, the, the, this slide is to not just show you the, uh, you know, just the performance data, but it, it's also also to show you that as as we go from Xeon generations, you know, if you guys are familiar with the Intel. Intel you know uh, the, the the traditional TikTok model, right? We, where whenever we we come out with a new architecture, typically the SIMD instructions improve. So what what this is this trying to show is that uh, the in in the previous generations, you know, uh, change right from um, it, it it used to be I, IV Sandy Bridge to IV Bridge, which was a it's a big architecture change, uh, where we we basically doubled the size of the AVX registers, and and we got almost double the performance. So uh, so in the upcoming, you know, Xeon, right? When it comes out, you will you'll, you'll most likely uh, get double the performance of this because you you're gonna get, you know, as many as double uh, the AVX registers. So, talking about encryption, right? So we we actually have uh, some benefits of ICL. Over even the AES NI instruction that's that's found on the x86 processors today. Um, so this is actually a case study that that we we published with with Netflix, where uh, they they were trying to basically uh, accelerate their open SSL termination, 
Um, they, they had tried other alternatives such as boring SSL, uh, but, but with ICEL, they, they were able to actually hit. So, so they actually ha have a 100 gig pipe, and they, they started with, with about 26, and, and with, with some ICEL and, and some, some other tunings related to ICEL, we were able to basically push their encryption performance you know, by, by three folds, right? So, um, so, so ICEL is, is basically tweakable, it's open source. You can, th this case study basically shows you that you can, uh, you, you can actually tune your system along with ICEL to get the best, best throughput. Um, it, it is recording, so um, just just coming to the to the last topic here. So, it, so it, how, how many of, of you guys actually use it is recording for your storage? Yeah. And and what what would be the uh, the back backing storage? What would be the primary storage? Was it is it Ceph? Is it okay? So so with with Ceph, um, ICL is actually the. Uh, the default erasure coding engine. We, we, we have integrated it probably about two years ago. Uh, we, we have a new update uh, which, which provides a big boost in, in EC performance uh, for, for the newest Xeons. Uh, which we have, it's, it's actually ICL version 2.18, which we are going to soon release. Um, but basically, erasure coding is, is, is fast with, with even, you know, like uh, we, we have integration into even HDFS for, for those HDFS users. Um, and, and there are several proprietary stacks that are using ICEL as well. So, so again, this is kind of a summary. You know, we, we, we have ICEL integrated into many scale out storage stacks, open source, proprietary. Uh, the primary use cases, the biggest use cases tend to be uh, erasure coding, uh, multi-buffer hash, encryption, uh, and compression in that order. Um, so here's a slide on where, where you can find all of those integration points um, and, and also uh, some links to the, to, to, to the original ISL pages where, where you, can, you can learn about how to integrate it into your applications. All right, so any questions so far? I, mean, I know a lot of folks just got in, so just want to, sorry. All okay. All right, well, thanks, thanks so much for attending. Yeah, so again, spdk.io is the spdk portal, and we, we have, uh, at the end of this material, we, we actually have a GitHub page for ICEL where you can check out all the details. Uh, everything is open source and uh, available to, for you guys to try out. Thank you so much.